Uh, it's my privilege to introduce to you Professor Ian Yield of Massey University, via Scotland, once upon a time. I've heard Ian speak on a raft of uh, uh, different things about different products in the last 10 years and it's always interesting because it's like looking uh, uh, into a crystal ball and, and it's hard to, yes, it's amazing imagining um, what will be 10 years down the track. So, um, like a spectral imaging and its uses, <laughs> yeah, but I'll, I'll leave you in these hands. Right. Okay, thanks, thanks very much. Okay, um, although I'm presenting it, there's quite a team of people that uh, work in this area now. There's um, um, got quite a few younger staff. Um, I don't know, I forget how many staff we have, but we've also got quite a number of students. So it's not just me. Um, I seem to just sign the checks and keep the reports, do the reporting now. Uh, rather than getting out in the field. but um, So what is hyperspectral imaging? Well, um, I think it was Ernest Rutherford that said there's two types of science. It's, there's physics and there's uh, stamp collecting. And um, the, um, oh, sorry, was it? If, you're not, if it's not physics, it's stamp collecting, something along those lines. But um, this is physics, but I'll try and keep the physics to a minimum. And what I'm going to try and do is explain to you what we're doing, why we're doing it, and what we think this, the benefits uh, will be. Okay, so, hyperspectral imaging. Um, now, a lot of what we're doing, and a lot of what I'll describe, is around a project that Ravensdown and MPI, so MPI you, you know obviously, Ravensdown most of you will know, uh, it's called Pioneering to Precision, and there's a number of objectives of the project. And it's to, to look to use remote sensing to better inform fertilizer application in hill country. So that's the basic aim of what we're trying to do. Uh, to estimate soil fertility and productive potential from the air by sensing the vegetation on the ground. So what we're not going to do is we're not going to go tramping around taking lots of soil samples. We do that while we're calibrating the sensor but we want to be able to do it from the air and work out what your fertility is. Uh, to use computer controlled hopper to improve delivery accuracy. So that's a computer controlled hopper on a top dressing plane. So that type of technology is here now and we're using that. So the, the reason that we used uh, the title pioneering to precision was really, I suppose, in deference to the fact that the top dressing industry was a genuinely pioneering industry, um, that it was necessary in terms of you know, getting fertilizer on our hill country. We, after bush was cleared, we had a lot of trouble then maintaining uh, fertility. But modern aircraft, um, bigger capacity, um, and what we're doing is putting computer control systems in those to control where the fertilizer goes. Okay, here's a a map of my favourite part of Palmerston North, the golf course. Um, that's a map that shows just, if you like, the visible part of the spectrum. So those are the parts of the spectrum that we can see. So there's a thing called an electromagnetic spectrum. Part of it's called the visible, and that's the visible part of the spectrum. Here's um, part of Massey University, you know, New Zealand's premier agricultural university. I thought I'd better get that in. Um, but um, we do some, again, just an image of the, some of the university farms, dairy number one, part of dairy number four, part of the campus. Now, every pixel in that image has about 440 different layers of information on it. And, um, okay, we can see different colours, but this sensor sees a lot more than just um, different colours. So, hyperspectral imaging or hyperspectral sensing is an extremely versatile technology. It was actually first uh, worked on in 1929. So, you know, nearly 90 years that it's been, this type of technology has uh, been from being thought about to actually being executed now. So what are we doing? We're looking to estimate plant nutrient concentration from the air. We want to estimate the nutritional value. By that, I mean ME, um, digestibility, so on. We can do, again, we think we can do that from the air species present. So the species of grass that are present are actually quite important to working out the fertility. And again, we can, we're working on being able to identify the species of the grass. So that will help you in terms of your management of the grass and also give you quite a few clues around the, the fertility. So it's like a forage test for every square meter of the farm. Okay. 
So we, we don't have to just pick a few points and um, make all our estimates on the basis of a few points. We actually measure the whole area of the farm. So it's got scale and it, we can use it, visualize. You can imagine we're generating a lot of data. Nobody's really interested in data, but if we can give you visible uh, visual images of what you've got, then we think that's a far more usable thing to, to do. And visualization of data is going to become more and more important, I think, in the future, because there's so much data. You, you know, a lot of people have a fear of data, fear of getting drowned in it, fear of a, you know, they talk about a tsunami of data, they talk about data graveyards, data lakes, you name it. And it all comes from a fear of data. So we've got to get back from data to how do we present you with the information? And that's kind of my job, if you like, a part of my job. Okay, um, so I said that there's, um, a sp this is the technical part, okay? So along the bottom line is, um, this, the first part says vis, so that's the visible part of the spectrum. So that's the wavelength. And th those are the wavelengths that we can see. So I can see there's a few orange lanyards because it's within that part of the vis visible spectrum. There's blue shirts, um, yellow, red. These are all parts of the spectrum that I can see. I can't see what's happening in the infrared. So this or the near infrared, that's the red part in the middle. And I can't see or you can't see what's happening in the shortwave infrared. But these instruments can. So just as I can recognize that that's blue, that's orange, that's green, these sensors have a lot more information that they can go on. So all sorts of things at different parts of the spectrum. So like, for example, chlorophyll absorption, we can see when something's dark green and when it's light green because the dark green absorbs more light and therefore it uh, appears darker. The opposite happens in the near infrared, it actually appears lighter. In the short wave, we can work out, we can start to work out what's actually happening in the biochemicals in the plant. So that gives us a lot of information. We can start to find out different things about the actual plant itself. So by combining all of these things, then we can build up a really accurate picture of what's actually happening. Okay, so that's, that's all I'm going to do in terms of the physics. I've probably offended anybody that has a knowledge of physics. I've probably offended them, but that's basically how it operates. So what we do is we did, first of all, we used to use sensors and I'll explain a bit more about that. But what we do now is we fly with an aircraft. It scans as you go back and it goes back and forward as it scans below the aircraft, builds up a picture. So each layer of information. So this camera has um, 448 layers of information on these different wavelengths along that spectrum. Okay, so every pixel has that level of information on it. You can see that it's a military aircraft, that's where this technology came from. So again, there's a, a picture of Massey. It's a survey we did recently. You can see the strips. So you can see we've basically flown it north to south. Unfortunately, we've just made, missed the race course here. It wasn't kind of on my radar at the time. I was more interested in what was happening at the farms. But you can see the strips, we go up, down, and then what we have to do is we stitch the image together. So that's not a trivial exercise. So we've got a team of people that can do all of that type of thing. And again, that's just the information that's in the visible part of the spectrum. Okay, then it but starts to get more interesting. So what we did previously is we, that we used to use sensors that we would have to carry on our backs and go around the farm and, um, you know, make measurements. And, but what, what we were able to do with that was we were able to prove that the technology actually worked. So the top line is if, if you were to prepare a sample, um, like there's a bagged sample, and compare it, say, to a lab measurement, you'd actually get very close agreement. If you go out in the field, you don't grind the sample, you just take a fresh sample. Okay, there's a bit more noise in the data, but you actually still get, the, if you look at the sites, there's red triangles represent one site, then, you know, it is still, it's a bit noisier, but it's still pretty accurate. So we thought, well, that's a pretty good uh, thing, but we could identify different sites on the farm, and you can see from that table that there are, um, one site there had pretty good pasture quality, one very poor. Now, this is a 3,000 or 2,500 hectare farm. 
we're not going to tramp around a 2,000 hectare farm to prepare samples and, and do all that. So there had to be a better way. So that's why we go from doing it from sensing to imaging, but that's where we sort of cut our teeth in this type of technology. So we know that it works, we understand it, and you know we can work with it. So what we then did was there's this evolution between sensing, getting away from the laboratory. The laboratory, if you send samples to a laboratory, it takes you a day or two to get the results back. The sensing, at least we could do it instantly, but it's limited because what we want to do is image the whole farm, and there's the equipment in a plane there. Okay, so it doesn't fit on a drone, it's too heavy, it's too valuable as well. Uh, I wouldn't put it in a drone. Okay, so what we then have is just a bit of a, a collage, if you like, of different um, images. Um, from your left, that's just part of a strip. And then you can see the diagram below, it's just the part of the spectrum and the, those signatures are the spectral signatures of different parts of the, um, the scene. So there'll be some road, some bush, some grass, and so on. So we use that type of information, and this next map is um, a map of nitrogen concentration on a farm. Okay, so that's part of a, I forget if it's a 600 hectare block or 800, but that's part of a block of land that you can see we've taken out the trees, we don't use, you know, we classify them out, but this is the pasture, we recognize what's pasture. And the red areas are where you've got a higher concentration of nitrogen than the green areas are a low, the yellow areas are somewhere in between. Okay, so we can map out, there's an example with nitrogen. So just to show you on a bigger scale, just to get you an idea of the level of detail that we can produce a map from, or make a map of. So that's the level of measurement that we're doing. The other advantage with this type of technology is, it's not, you don't take one sample to do one thing, you fly it once and you get a whole lot of different information out of it. So hopefully, if I've got the order right, so ME, so clearly ME is pretty important. Um, a lot of people realize that it's variable. This was in autumn, probably didn't realize how low it had got in some areas. Um, so again, you know, we, we often, I think, soften the results a, a little bit in our human way. But if you've got, if you can measure it, okay, what would you, you know, how could you put, well, what class of stock would you put on some of those areas? What would be your expectations in terms of weight gain or actually maintaining weight and so on? So in terms of a management tool, we think that there's a lot of useful information for farmers. So it's not just ME, there's a whole lot of other things. So um, another thing is it's important that if it works on my farm, then it works on yours and it works on your neighbours and it works in the South Island and it works all over the country. So that's partly what we're doing now, is that we're looking at eight different farms. We're in the research phase. We've got until, um, well, basically, we've done most of the measurement for the research phase. Each farm, there's 80 sites on each farm that we'll take five different samples from. And we use that to calibrate the image. So we use, we use all of that information. It's a, you know, it's a big cost, but it's worth doing well. Then what we're trying to do is can we come up with a calibration that will be, we can use it nationally? Because a lot of the problem is that you might find that you get a good explanation on site one, and you go down to site eight and it's not so good. So what we're trying to do is build a calibration that will be robust for the whole country. And that will make life a lot simpler. So what other things can we tell? So as I mentioned, it's very versatile data. So there's your maps of NPK, K, sulfur, <laughs> copper, magnesium. These are all the concentrations within the pasture. So things like copper came up as an example that people were interested in. Are there areas or times of the year where copper is deficient? And clearly there were. And so, you know, there's a lot of debate around what, what should I do around copper? So this type of system would actually assist in giving you a, a lot more information. Um, uh, NDVI is just like a vegetation index that we use to, to look at, say, how green something is and how well it's growing, how much of it there is. Dry matter is obviously important as well. Okay. So extremely versatile data. We can also, because we're, um, 
got the data in such a fine format. That's the same farm, and I think uh, what's that potassium concentration in the pasture? We could, I mean, probably not many of you would want to look at the map on the left, you know, unless you understood the landscape. Then, well, okay, the middle um, at this stage, hmm, okay, it's interesting, but it's still quite variable. Well, you might want, <laughs> if we're going to program an aircraft, we might want the map on the right hand side that will tell us. Um, you know, make our plan according to that type of information there. We can also go into 3D and hopefully if the chap can press the button. Yep. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you behind the screen there, he's sitting away down. <laughs> okay, some of you may have seen this, might take a wee while. Um, we can incorporate also just the terrain information. And this is again, just the, this is the color image and we'll just show you the, the level of uh, sensing that can be achieved. You can actually, on a decent projector, you could see the sheep on here. And that's the farm that we've been measuring. So we could populate that with your nitrogen, with your ME, with you know any NPKS, those sorts of things. You could populate your map with that information for you to start making decisions. Um, and obviously this is why Ravensdown are, are doing the work, or we're doing the work for Ravensdown. Okay, so I think again that because there's so much information, we're going to have to find much better ways to give you the information. So how do we do that effectively? Okay, okay so that's just an example of 3D. Um, obviously, you know, you can do it over a farm, over a whole, a whole catchment and so on. There's a lot, a lot of interest in, in doing it over different scales as well. Okay, so back to why and what the process is around the project. So we've been tasked mainly with the remote sensing part of it. So the idea is that you, you fly over the farm, you sense what you've got in terms of the soil fertility or in terms of the vegetation cover. That then informs what you should be doing with your top dressing. Okay, then we've got the computer controlled um, hopper and the idea is that we will grow more grass. And there's a fair bit of uh, um, evidence to suggest that we could grow an awful lot more grass if we got it right. So we did some work about 10 years ago um, just looking at how we can tidy up um, uh, what a pilot does. And I, I know there's a pilot in the audience and I'm not trying to offend anyone. but We've got to, I think, make, being a, an ag pilot is actually a, a pretty uh, strenuous type of job. It's exacting. You've got to know exactly where you are in terms of your, where you are in your airspace. You've got to control a hopper. You've got to do a lot of different things. And we think that this type of system and this technology will make life a lot easier. So there was one, that was just an early example where we're looking at the bottom one was where we're looking at uh, monitoring the, um, the sorry, using the boundaries and using the aircraft to recognize when it was on a boundary and switch off and switch on, okay? Um, and we think we can get aircraft to be as accurate, if not more accurate than trucks over even gently rolling land. Trucks are not accurate over, over rolling country, okay? You've got a lot of issues going on there as well. We think we can improve um, aircraft um, spread patterns by quite a margin. Okay, so that's why we've done quite a lot of performance testing and again quite a laborious type of thing and you can see why we have a big team up the front there. So we've been doing a lot of um, performance testing of the aircraft. Here's an, a map that was done last year I think and this shows you just different rates on a property. It wasn't, um, it was just pre-programmed, it wasn't using the variable rate in terms of each block got a, a uniform rate. The important thing as well is that the aircraft, the hopper's control is linked to the speed, so that as the aircraft speeds up, then the hopper will open. That's one of the biggest factors that gives you variable variability in your spread rate, is the hopper door opening and your speeds are changing as the uh, aircraft's flown. So what this one was successful in doing was avoiding a lot of waterways, some unproductive areas, gullies, all of those sorts of things. And again, that's something else that can be put into the maps that we showed you to begin with. That you can have that level of detail in the map that you might have areas that you want to avoid completely. Okay? 
So again, it's a technology that's, you know, it's uh, moving forward pretty quickly. So, as I say, I think I've summarized it, but can avoid sensitive areas, unproductive, less tiring to fly, um, different, apply different rates automatically. So we could do that in a single flight line, we could change rates, uh, more accurate, less variable, uh, compensate for changes in airspeed. So there's a lot of different aspects to, to what's going on there. Um, there's just an example, this was up in north, up in Limestone Downs, we looked at a paddock, this is about a couple of years ago, but again, just doing some tests, the middle paddock we wanted to put at a much lower rate, just for test purposes, could we do it, and we found that, yep, we can, we can manage to, to control the hopper sufficiently to allow those sorts of things to happen. So it gives you a lot more flexibility, a bit more freedom, can avoid a lot of those areas that you might think are pretty marginal and so on. So, as I say, it's going to take a little bit of time to work out exactly how we're going to do all of these things. And I think that's where there's going to be a lot of engagement with farmers to, to suss out. Everybody's different. Everybody's going to want different things. So there's going to be a lot of uh, toing and froing, I think, just to work out what exactly people will want, because there's no one answer. Um, other things, and I, I didn't put the table, I don't expect you to read, but what it was is we can different things we can do. So we've already mentioned calculate the effective farming area, area of pasture, detect the difference between grass species. So if we know the difference of between brown top and rye grass, then you're clearly going to farm that differently. Uh, certain times of the year, you know where your clover is. Uh, kaikuya, all of the, well, maybe not down here, but further north where we've got kaikuya. All of those things can be detected. And the sensor, we did some experiments and this, the sensor was about 96% successful in trying to distinguish or the technology, not this particular sensor, the technology was successful in even discriminating between different types of ryegrass. So that's the level of detail that we can get down to. So clearly, you know, very detailed explanations of what's happening. So there's just an example. The three ryegrasses, I think, are the bottom, bottom row, left-hand side. So I think most of us would be hard pushed to tell the difference uh, if you were looking at umpteen odd samples. So, but this, um, this technology can. So again, one of, one of our other PhDs working on that. Okay, so where we've gone from is typically your uh, Ravens Down or Balance Rep would come out and maybe do three transects on a farm, might do four. But the transect would be, say, maybe do 27, takes 27 cores or some number like that, mark out where they've been, put it in one bag, and you would make your decision on however many hundreds of thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars you were going to spend on fertilizer on the basis of that information, plus some other bits and pieces that you, you'd be able to put together. What we think we can do is give you a much more, much more data on, in terms of how do you make that decision. Okay, so again, bear in mind, what, what I'm illustrating to you, remember you saw, I think it was Craig's presentation about the idea, and then we're probably halfway through the second stage. This has got a bit to go yet, but the, the technology works, the information, we, we know that we can provide a lot of useful information, it's how we do that in the future. So, what I was saying about data, we go from three transects over 3,000 hectares, to four and a half million data points per hectare, which works out at about 13 and a half billion data points for the whole farm. Again, not your problem, my problem. I've got to try and work out ways to get you useful information from all of that data. And that's the sort of thing that we're, that's what we're busy working on at the moment, okay? So we call it the new data economy. So data and visualization, really important. Um, it's a, I think it's a completely new concept in the way that we'll farm in the future. It'll be much more data driven. I think a lot of you are also, is it, um, I think are based on observation and you know, you, you look at your own property, you make observations, you have not, you know, you use your knowledge, you try and improve your knowledge and you're reflecting all the time. Whereas I think that previously, the, a lot of the science has been based on careful experimentation and a bit of trickle down at the end. Whereas what we're doing now is giving boom, there's a whole lot of data up front 
And it's like that, a similar process to what you would go through. You would look at the information, try and start to make up your mind about it. So I think the science process is also going to change how we do things and hopefully we'll get some rapid um, uptake. Clearly there's, a pro uh, there's an issue around uh, rural um, broadband. That there's no point in me sending you terabytes of information if it's going through your phone line. So there's a lots of issues like that we've got to resolve. We're trying to reduce the amount of information that we would send you, but clearly there will still be some. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of challenges ahead. So it's not, a, it's not um, if you would say, done and dusted yet. Okay, other things that I think are quite exciting that we can do. Is, this is the sensor that we use, the thing with the box with the orange stripes. Doesn't look much for 600,000, but that's what you get. Um, and the box of tricks next to it. We can put it on a tripod. So I could, for example, look around this room and I could make an image of the, of the room and I could get all the hyperspectral information. Now, why I'd want to do that, I don't know. But uh, anyway, that, that's what I could do. But where it might be useful, so there, this is just an example where if you look at the table, sorry, the chart, there's, there's um, roadway, soil, a white ute, and vegetation, and each have their own spectral signature. So what we could do is things like, in a, in a meat plant, we could look at carcasses as they go by, or we, can, we know we can look at offal and detect problems with um, uh, animal health problems from offal. We could look in a, you imagine a robot that goes around a, um, a, an orchard, that tracks and looks at things at, at a much closer detail where you've got disease. We could do a lot of disease detection. There's a whole lot of things that we could do. It's a very, very versatile technology. So that's one scale. We could get even further down the scale. That's the same thing based in a lab where we could look at a, an individual plants. So why would we want to do that? Well, so um, at the university, for example, we might want to do some response experiments to fertilizer. Now, previously, what we've had to do is you set up a fairly complicated trial. Every time you want to measure something, you have to cut it, you have to destroy a certain proportion of your measurements because you can only do it once. With this type of technology, you don't have to do that. You can simplify things a lot more. So things like people like plant breeders, this could make this type of technology, and there's already a number of them working on it around the world this could make a, a huge difference to them as well. So it's not just on farm, this type of technology will be used for plant breeders and a lot of other people as well. Okay, so I think that's about all I wanted to say and hopefully I've stimulated you enough to ask a few questions. I think we've got plenty of time. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thanks Ian. Uh, plenty of time for questions and discussion, so um, I'll leave it open to, to the floor. Okay. Down the back there. Um, at the moment it's too large and there are some limitations um, again um, getting into the physics of it what we're doing is we're splitting there's only so much energy reaches a sensor and then you've got to split it a number of different ways and so the level of energy that you if you imagine it is in say channels if you imagine it is in channels, the amount of energy is actually very small. And the more you miniaturize that instrument, the smaller it gets, the noisier your data. So there are some that, that, that will work, not to the extent that this will, but it may be that we can improve um, the, the technology sufficiently. But we've been promised things for about 18 months now, smaller units from other companies, and they still haven't arrived. And, so it, it may come, it will get, certainly get cheaper, it will get lighter, but if it will get lighter enough to use on a drone, I don't know. But then the drones are becoming heavier, you see them used for sprays and so on now. So maybe the two will meet, yeah. Russell. Yeah. Um, where do you know, um, you've spoken about drones and bits of pieces, but you know, it'd be great to be able to see that drone a job spraying the weeds out or um, gorse on hills or something like that. But you need identification precision where it is yep. applied and, and even some of these weeds that have come in to scan you probably see that you haven't got them. Yep. And how are you yep. possibly do something? Yep, um, so we can certainly things, a lot of those weeds that you mentioned we can pick out. 
So we can be quite specific about gauche and rush and you know all those sorts of things that we can. Um, the, the issue is that each pixel on that image is about a meter. So if you've got, it's, it's a bit difficult. There are other techniques called um, spectral and mixing. So for example, these guys were showing me how they could find a landmine that might be about that size, or they could find an aluminium can of co a Coke can that was about that size. And the reason that it was because it altered the spectral signature, it was, it was shown up as part of the image. Now, we've, one of the things we're trying to do is work out, okay, I'd be pretty confident that if you put a Coke can on a, a meter square, we could find it. But could we tell the difference between a, you know, a different type, one type of thistle and a next then? I'm not sure at this stage. That's the sort of thing we, continue, we need to continue to do. But we could certainly, I think things like, can we tell thistles from grass? Well, I'd be pretty confident that yes, we could. But it, it obviously also depend on the size and, and what have you. So a, a meter pixel sounds, doesn't sound very much, but then, you know, once you zoom in, you, you see that it's, you know, a reasonable size, so, yeah. How long do you think it'll be before it's useful for fertilizer and you know, industry? Yeah, um, well, I think the plan is, um, I'm just trying to remember, I, I keep getting threatened to be shot by Ravensdown because I see how much it's going to cost and when is it going to be available. But um, it's, so we've got, in the project, we've got a go and no go point next year, about June next year, is when we say, yep, this is worth it, or no, it's not worth it. And then there's a, quite an extension program, I think, for about three years after that, so where it will be gradually rolled out, I think, to then become an offering that they'll do. So I think that's a sort of typical timetable that they're looking at, yeah. Great. Let's see. Options for Pretty much doing pasture mess on the whole country with this technology. Yeah, um, I've had a long history of doing pasture measurement, and pasture measurement is not as easy as people make out. So the the problem. Um, so if you were going and measuring, say, a crop of wheat, for example, I reckon that's a piece of cake because it's a, it's a monoculture. It's all the same. It's, it's really easy to do. The problem that you have in terms of um, um, the two things, I think, are one is that grass is a, is a constantly changing thing. Its state of maturity is always changing. It's dry matter. I think we have a far better chance with those things. We use some drone-based technology to estimate pasture mass. And I would, I don't think I'll be shot for saying it, but I, I do think they're a bit prone to error. And repeatability is a real problem. So you go out one week and so a, a drone will tell you, it's, a, it's fantastic for example to tell you the spatial variability, so where's your weaker areas and so on. A dairy farmer might want to come out the following week and measure again to find out well how much is my pasture grown. That's where I think the struggle in terms of the level of accuracy that they can provide. This technology is clearly expensive. So whether you would do something like that use something like that to um, measure uh, your pasture mass. I don't think you would, it's a $600,000 camera. Um, but we will. We know where to look, we know how we can make things cheaper. We've kind of gone for some cheaper instruments to start with. We think we need something a bit more complicated. So we're, we're kind of going from two ends of the scale. This is, if you like, the Rolls Royce. And we've tried some others that are, are uh, not as good or not as complex and don't give you as much information. We found that they weren't as reliable as we'd hoped and we're probably going to move back up that scale a little bit to, to get you the level of reliability. But there are th other things you can do. I mean, you could do, like use a satellite, for example. So satellites are, the satellite information is getting more frequent. It's getting better quality imagery. So things like um, maybe late spring, looking at, you know, where's it drying off. A satellite will tell you things like where the, you know, if you're getting um, dry, you know, dry matter is increasing, it's drying off. Satellite information should tell you. Ground-based temperature will also tell you. So if, you, if it's warming up, you know that the grass is dying and what have you. So that it might be too late, but what it's doing is it's giving you a spatial picture of how much of that is happening and where it's happening and so on. So there's different sources of 
information. I had a, some visitors from California about a couple of months ago. And I, took, I said to them, look, what I want is um, a hangar on my property that when the conditions are right, it opens up, the drones fly out, monitor what I want to monitor, come back, download all the data, and then it's all done. And they sort of looked at me, oh yeah, whatever. And then I took them to a farmer, and he said, right, what I want is a hanger on my farm that knows exactly when it's going to go and measure, goes out, does it, comes back, downloads the data, and I can get the data on my phone. And that's, I think, where we've got to go. That a lot of, there's got to be still a lot more automation. It's not, every, it's not for everybody that wants to fly drones and what have you. And I think that, techno, that technology has changed a lot in sort of four, four or five years that we've been using drones. It's changed hugely. They've got much better the level of control, the automation, and so on. So again, you know, I just think keep keep an eye on all these sorts of things that are happening, not just you know what we are doing. So a bit of a long-winded answer. Well done. Obviously, it's been a bit of work done. That's cool. And that thing seems to be pretty impressive. You know, it's got <laughs> um, I was wondering if it could, uh, could see that it could detect groundwater. What, what, what's the opportunity below the surface? Is um, there it's, it's really only it will see the first surface that it comes to. It doesn't have enough energy to penetrate anything. It's just really looking at the light that's coming back up off a target. But in saying that, things like lakes, there's a lot of work being done around the lake, around the world, looking at things like so if say in Taranaki, you might want to fly it over some oil rigs. Is there any spills? You could easily detect that. Um, pollution in water, levels in nitrates in water, turbidity, all of those sorts of things you could do. On I've, Most of what I've seen, it's on lakes, but it, and, and some in sea, but you could, yeah, you could do that type of thing, yeah. A little bit. Um, previous question, does the uh, definition increase with the drop in altitude of the flyby? Yes. So if you want to get, so if, so that, when you see it in the lab, each pixel is about a millimeter. So when it's about 0.8 of a meter off the ground, so I can take an image of a, of a, I think it will generate something ridiculous, like 450 million data points over a, over a square meter. And there'll be each point, so you imagine in a plant, so I'm wanting to see what a plant's, say, responding to a nutrient or something like that, or a disease then each millimeter, each square millimeter of that I've got, got measurements. So yeah, you just drop down. As, but they also put another one up that's got a similar performance if you fly twice as high. So it will have a similar resolution. So you could fly it the, the way that, so we fly at 2,000 feet um, because we think that's a good compromise between the level of information that we need and the speed. So we can do up to about, um, I think it's about a thousand hectares an hour, something like that. It might be a wee bit more, but um, if you there's another instrument to sit out of the same stable that you can fly twice as high, twice as wide, and you cover the ground much much faster. So, but yeah, you could bring it down. You could use that one at the same height and get double the definition or double the resolution. Yeah. How do you emulate the um, changes in in the variables, like yep. soil moisture and temperature, yep. that yep. can also influence the productivity? Yep. So when we obviously we're measuring through the atmosphere, so we're up at 2,000 feet, and we're measuring on the ground surface. So changes in light and shadow, um, moisture levels, all of those things have got to be taken account of. And so there's even before we start to process the information in terms of the spectral information, there's about 10 different steps that we use to make sure, so if you like, we're, we're trying to put it onto a 3D, a three-dimensional land um, map of the farm, if you like, for want of a better word. But um, we take out any distortions, we look at atmospheric correction, we look at sh trying to attempt for recognize where the shadow, all of those types of things. If the moisture, um, this part of those curves, you saw those two, there's two dips in it, that's associated with moisture. So again, we know what's going on there. So if you're looking at water bodies or very wet soil, that would probably show up as a, if it's really wet, um, if there's not too much ground cover. But remember, it's looking at the surface of what you're looking at. So, yeah. so does it influence the accuracy of your um, estimation? Um, 
Well, it obviously will, because if, so the best way that I could possibly get a measurement would be to go and take a sample, dry it, grind it, put it in, and, and use that machine and compare it to a lab, ex, uh, lab thing. So if I take a sensor and then I, I just take a reading, say, from a whole grass plant, and obviously the architecture of the grass and as it matures and what have you is going to have an effect. So it's going to make the data slightly noisier. If I'm looking through an atmosphere of, say, 2,000 feet, it's not going to have a huge... Well, it can have a big effect, but there's, as I say, there's about 10 steps that we can take to work out what is the difference, what are the differences in lighting conditions. We also have targets on the ground that we use continually, so things like roads or roofs, or if we know on an image, and we can then something that doesn't change, then we can look at those and then use those to evaluate is the image actually true and correct. So there's a lot of different things that you can do to, to try and eliminate error as much as possible. Yeah. So one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, if we've got a um, limitation penetrability penetration of this waste, how do you measure um, the nutrient level in a soil with 75 millimeter? Yep. Quantity? We're not measuring the soil. What we're doing is measuring the plant and looking at the association between the plant and the soil. So what we, but what we are doing is while we're, that, that diagram that I showed you with all the green, the farm with all the green dots on it, those are sites where we're using calibration measurements to take measurements of the vegetation and measurements of the soil. So that's what we're using as, as part of our calibration process. So we, I think we have something, it might be your seven, 8,000 measurements now to, to look at the, the comparison. Yeah, we've already had a few people asking us around some, um, you know, whether there are different soil types and different types of vegetation are kind of grown as a result of that. So that's something that we've still to investigate. But yeah, I would imagine so. Things like you could draw kind of inference from the fact that there's a different type of vegetation in that area compared to this area over here. Yeah. We'll go to the back. Um, coming back to the beautiful right hopper, mm -hmm. you've got to say that it Um, no. Um, so what we so we've got, if you like, there's a model. We call it the ballistic a ballistic model, um, and what it, it does is it it can describe how the fertilizer comes out of the plane. So what you'll find is that as the plane's coming along, okay, it goes in front slightly, but then gravity takes over, and it, okay, it might be still slightly in front or moving slightly forward but it's getting pretty close to vertical. So the trick, what we're trying to do is, this is the boundary, when do you switch off the, the hopper? So that's the sort of thing we're doing. We're not trying to, so what we would do is, if say you're coming up a hill, or you're going up and you're slowing down, it would be the fact that it's slowing down that would dictate the hopper door opening. It wouldn't be the angle of the plane that would dictate, it would be the fact that you're slowing down. So Yep. Um, yeah, again, um, there is a slight difference, and I'm, not, I'm trying to remember if it does take differences in altitude off the ground into account or not. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it may, it may not, actually. But um, I can't, I, I'm not sure. It may, it may do, but it's got, I mean, all these systems, um, like the top, most of the top dressing aircraft in the country have pretty good... Uh, high quality GPS in them. They're updated five times a second, so they'll be a bit of information there. So yeah. I'll, I'll check up and find out. Any more questions? Good discussion there. Yeah, um, just going along the those, taking all those thermal images of the different levels of nutrients, and then you, but when the plane flies, you've got one mix of fertilizer in the plane. Um, so you're gonna have to make a lot of compromises to um, 
get the right mix for that farm. So because you can only alter the rate of the food that's coming out of the plant, yeah, not yeah. the rate of the different nutrients there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand that. Yeah. So I mean, again, it's a question of trying to work out what's the best form of fertilizer that you would put in that would get you as close to meeting your needs as you can. Yeah, we wouldn't be, we're not advocate, well, I don't know, I mean, it's up to Ravens then, but we've, we've done a lot of work in, um, um, from top dressing aircraft, looking at blended fertilizers and so on, and generally it's not a fantastic idea to try and blend a whole lot of different nutrients in the, the hopper, or pre-mix, you know, because there can be problems. Just well, to change tack, I'm scared about the thing in the meat processes. They've got to take over the people that are doing the big thing. Well, yeah, potentially. But as I say, it's, got, it's probably just at that idea stage and the experimental stage. So. But we know that we can detect, say, problems in the off. We've, one of the projects we've looked at, we've um, looked at uh, well, we, we know we can tell the difference between lamb meat from a male lamb and a female lamb, so we can detect differences in quality. And we can we've looked at some where we knew there was some disease present, and we were able to recognise the, every every carcass that came through that had been pointed out that there was a disease. We were able to identify. We kind of did it blind, but we were able to identify them um, just by looking at the offal. So that might be a way, you know, when it comes into the meat works, whether it's RFID, that you just link it in, and uh, then you link it to the carcass and pull it apart for inspection, pull it to one side for inspection. But I, I don't know, maybe you can do it with the, um, um, the carcass, but also the, one of the challenges is doing it real time, so that in a meat works, you're gonna have to do things, it's gonna be, have to be you know, done real time, and that's still a bit of a challenge for some of this type of technology. Lucky last question of this one is when you're using scope. Coral lines are having still image creeping potentially used, for instance, to take um a dam, take potentially quieter once a year and it's not that. Yep, um, we know we just I was just messing around one day and I know that a, a sheep has a different spectral signature to a cow, obviously, or different cows. So probably different breeds. Yeah, I think you could you could do all that type of thing. I mean, it sounds a bit bizarre to, to do it or say it, but yeah, you could easily pick out, um, like say, certainly different breeds of cows and th those sorts of things you'd be able to pick out, no problem. Yep. Count them, yeah, yeah, just get the software to, to count them, yeah. Yep. I mean, that's been done already just for some of these other systems that you know can count, yeah. Oh, well, uh, thank you very much, Ian. That's uh, okay. uh, fascinating and enlightening. And very, very good. Thank you.